Good morning and welcome to the day of our Sunday school start for this fall. My name is Pam Quinn and my husband Dave and myself will be your worship leaders this morning. When I hear the word school and being a former school teacher, I still get a little excited because September has always felt more like the start to a new year rather than January 1st for me. September has the promise of a new beginning with starting a new grade, learning a new skill, and also a chance for us to expand our spiritual growth through going to Sunday school. It is a time for new clothes, new shoes, new school supplies, all those empty notebooks that you're almost scared to write in because they smell so clean and fresh, the newly sharpened pencils and crayons, such anticipation when opening the box for the first time. Oh my, and the markers, especially the scented ones. What fun! I had many a grade one student after the first day of school going home with maybe some orange or purple or black on their noses because they just could not resist giving them a good sniff. When I taught kindergarten, we would start the day with a morning song. I think it came from a longer song, but I just chose the first few lyrics and added pictures and actions, and we would sing it every morning. I thought we could learn it this morning. This is how it goes. It's a new day, think new thoughts. It's a new way, clean your hearts. It's a new day in the land. Okay, can you try that with me? <laughs> Actions, everybody, it's good to get your arms up, okay? It's a new day, think new thoughts. It's a new way, clean your hearts. It's a new day in the land. We would always discuss what these lyrics meant, and I always got a chuckle when we talked about it, what it meant to clean our hearts. I would get responses like, you have to drink lots of water, <laughs> or you need to get a teeny tiny brush to swallow so it scrubs your heart. This led to a perfect opportunity to talk about how each day was a new day from God to start all over. So things that had happened yesterday that they were not happy about could be wiped clean and a new day with many great opportunities was just waiting to happen. Second chances. Jesus offers that same promise anew each morning for us. In Lamentations 3, 22 to 23, it says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Please join me in the call to worship. It is based on James 1, 16 and Matthew eleven twenty-nine. 29. Come to the Lord, all you people, asking God to fill your needs. Come to the Lord, all you people, seeking answers for your troubled souls. Come to the Lord, all you people, knocking and waiting. Know that God is ready to meet us all in this place. Could you please stand for the opening prayer and if able, continue for the opening songs. Dear Heavenly Father, 
As we embark on this new Sunday school year, we ask for a sense of wonder for both the teachers and the students. Help us go deeper than factual information in our learning so that your teaching permeates our heart and causes transformation to take place. Thank you for giving us the encouragement of new mercies every morning. Help us to cling to that promise and look towards this year with excitement. In Jesus' name, amen. Just as an additional announcement, I don't see her here today, but it's for Del Andre's birthday. And I know she's listening, and so I'd just like to tell her that uh, we are thinking of you and hope you celebrate well. Let's stand and sing our first song.
seated. We'd like to call all the children to the front, and uh, Sherry Dick has a story for you this morning. Is this on now? We got it? Good morning. Good morning. Boy, there's a lot of exciting things going on today. We have our Sunday school kickoff, and then after church, the service today, we get to go have lunch and celebrate our Sunday school kickoff. What's something that happened exciting for you this week? You have anything? Yes, Savea? School, yeah, so what grade did you start this week? Grade five, wow. Grade one, that's so exciting. Oh my goodness. And it's so great to be back with your friends and the teachers and everyone. That's awesome. Um, today, there's actually, you're going into kindergarten, yay. That's so very exciting to be in kindergarten before grade one, isn't it? Yeah. So today is also another special day to celebrate. Does anybody know what day it is today? It is Sunday. You're right. We can celebrate that it's Sunday for sure. But I'll give you some hints. So a lot. What did you say, Patrick? Oh. Patrick, I didn't even have to give hints. How did you know? <laughs> it is. It's Grandparents' Day today. It is. And you know, we started this a long time ago, way back in 1995. Canada had made this a national special day for grandparents. So you're right. All across Canada, we can celebrate the grandparents today. You want to move closer? Okay. <laughs> so, um, I think that for grandparents, I think you guys all maybe call them different names sometimes. What do you call your grandparents? Avea? I call my dad. Grandma and Grandpa. Okay, same. That's a great thing to call your dad, Daddy. Yeah. So I've also heard other names like Oma and Opa, or there's Baba. And you know, I had my daughter-in-law teach me in Japanese how to say Grandpa and Grandma. And I'm going to see if you guys can catch on to this. So Grandma is Obachan. Can you say that? Obachan. Very good. And Grandma is Ojichan. Ojichan. Actually, I got that mixed up. <laughs> Grandpa, <laughs> Grandpa is Ojicha, and Grandma is Obacha. Yeah, that's all I can do. <laughs> so I'm going to draw you a picture, and I want you to see if you can guess what this is going to be here, okay? All right, so I'm going to put it here. Maybe I won't use the mic while I'm drawing. I don't know. Not that talented here. Okay. That would be great. Thank you so much. Okay, so we're going to start here. I'm going to make a circle, spinning around. What? How smart are you guys to know this? How did they know this was a snail? <laughs> okay, we're going to finish our snail then. There we go. There's his tail. I'm going to get his head on here. Oops, it's too skinny of a neck. There we go. Okay, his mouth. And now I'm going to draw his eyes. I ran out of room. There we go. And maybe that's a happy face. That's not a very good snail. I never have the gift of being an artist. But anyway, that's a snail. So is a snail fast or slow? Slow. slow. 
Very, very slow. That's right. He's very slow. And do you think it's better to be fast or better to be slow? Wow, got all different answers. Okay, raise your hand if you think you're faster than your grandparents. <laughs> ah, okay. And you know, as we get older, or maybe even become grandparents, we start to slow down. And some people might think that getting older and slowing down is a bad thing. But you know, in the Bible, it says that God wants us to be slow. He does. God wants us to slow down. That's right, so we don't trip. You're right. We have to be still. We have to pause. We need to stop. And we need to spend time with God so we can hear him talking to us. If God wants us to be slow, then why is everybody always rushing around? Why are we too busy trying to get things done? Why do you think that is? If God wants us to be slow, why are we always doing, the, doing rushing and busy and running around and doing this and doing that? Oh, maybe so we can get energy, sure. So you know that even Jesus, he sat down by the well for a rest, and Jesus took a nap in a boat. He spent time with his heavenly Father in nature. And I absolutely love being outside in nature with God. There's so many neat things to see and hear and smell and taste. I just love being outside. What is one of your favorite things that you've seen outside? Peas. Awesome. From the garden. To pick peas from the garden. That's wonderful. Avea, what do you like to see outside? Trees. Yeah, for sure. Flowers. That's okay. So God wants us to be really slow like a snail or even like a turtle. God wants us to be slow and steady. He wants us to slow down so we can work with his gifts and talents that he's given us. He doesn't want us rushing through life. God wants us to be slow to speak and slow to anger. Do you know what that means? Slow to speak and slow to anger. God wants us to listen first and think about things before we take a step or make a choice or do something we have to think first, is this choice good or is it bad? Would Jesus do it or would he not do it? So we have to think about those things and see if, if we're making a good choice. You know, I didn't have all of my grandparents growing up. When I was growing up, I had one grandma until about the age of 10 years old. But I do enjoy visiting other grandparents just like yours. I enjoy going to see all these different grandparents, and I love to spend time with them and visit with them because they have so many incredible stories to tell us. They have so much, they're so smart and they're so wise, and we have a lot that we can learn from our grandparents. And there's a lot of lessons that they learned in their lives that they can teach us. So, you know, your grandparents and older people, because some people aren't grandparents, they have lots of stories and, and lessons that they can share with you. And I think it's very important that we spend lots of time with the elders and with grandparents. There's so much love that they can give us and so much that we can learn from them. In the Bible, it says... The beauty of the aged is gray hair. Gray hair is beautiful. That means that older people have so many wonderful things to share with us and teach us, including lots and lots of love. So after the service today, I think that we should all spend some time maybe looking for grandparents or even maybe somebody with gray hair or somebody that doesn't have gray hair 
and somebody that's just older than us and wish them a happy grandparents day, give them a hug, say that we love them, and spend some time with them to learn from them. So, happy grandparents day. Let's stand and sing two more songs.
I don't know how many people here know, but I've had a goal in mind for the last two years to read my way through the entire Old Testament. And I've just finished, basically, excuse the words, slogging my way through the book of Jeremiah. It's 50, 52 chapters of um, bad news for the God's people. And uh, now I get to look forward to Lamentations. So. Before that, though, Pastor Peter is going to come forward, and I'm looking forward to this, an uplifting message on the book of James. And so I'd like you to ask you to bow your heads, and I'll say a few words uh, for, on behalf of Peter. Dear Lord, we ask you to be with Peter to give him some discernment and wisdom as he begins the project of instructing us through the book, the book of James. We especially be with him today, relieve any anxiety, and help him to have the courage to move forward and speak to us uh, without notes for the first time, Lord. So we ask you to be with Peter, comfort him, and be with each one of us in the congregation. Open our hearts and minds to the message you'd like us to hear today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Peter. Good morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. And yes, there is a little bit of anxiety to preach without notes. So today we're starting a sermon series on the book of James. About four months ago, um, I was reading James as part of my personal devotion, and I read it, and read it again, and read it a few more times, and it hit a couple of things, just hit me right between the eyes. And that's when I felt that God was laying it on my heart to, to go through the book of James and do expository uh, preaching, uh, exposing the truth and the message that comes from the book of James. So it's a different style, certainly for me, this is the first time I've, uh, I've done that. Um, then, you know, I thought, well, I'll write my sermon out. But I felt last Sunday that God was saying, but you know this stuff, you're studying this. You're, you understand what James is trying to tell us. So that explains why we're looking at the book of James. It's written by James. Now, many of the epistles are to the Colossians or the Ephesians or the Galatians, but there are seven epistles that are identified by the author. The author is James. Which James? There were two uh, disciples named James. First, it was uh, James, uh, the son of Zebedee, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and there was James, the son of Alphaeus. Surprisingly, it's neither of those two. This is written by James, the half-brother of Jesus. I say half-brother because uh, Jesus was born of uh, God and Mary, the Virgin Mary, and James was born of Joseph and Mary. James was not a believer. James did not understand that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah. And so it was only after Jesus' resurrection that he became a believer, that he became a Christian, that he recognized his half-brother was actually God, God the Savior. It was written to the early church. Now, the early church, as we'll see, consisted mostly of Jews because Jesus went to the uh, synagogue 
Jesus went to where the Jews were and preached to the Jews. It was written approximately 48 AD, which means that it was about 15 years after Jesus' uh, death and resurrection. And so James, it appears, took a, a piece of paper and started writing. It's not always coherent. It's not always um, a message that you can follow and go from point one, two, and three, which I struggled with a little bit because I'm a very organized person and I like to have things nice and neat and orderly. But I can really get into James and I hope that you can as well. So we're going to start. If you have your Bible or your device, please read with me. Um, Read with me uh, James 1, uh, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. So what I'm reading from is the New International Version, the 1984 edition. There was an update in 2011, and not much changed other than it was more inclusive. When I read Brothers, it's now translated as brothers and sisters. And of course, the language is meant to be all-inclusive. When we look at the opening sentence here in uh, the book of James, James says it's translated as servant of God. But if you go back to the Greek, it's actually a bond service, bond servant, a slave. And slaves came about in two ways back in the olden days, uh, the time of the Roman Empire. Either they were uh, people that were captured, enemies that were fighting in war, were captured and brought back to Rome. Or if you couldn't pay your debts, you had to uh, enter into a contract with the person you owed the money to, and for five years or seven years or whatever term was worked out, you had to be a bond servant, to work off your debt, to be a slave to that person for all intents and purposes. So James identifies himself as a slave to God and to the Lord Jesus Christ. As I said, it was uh, written to the Jewish believers um, who were scattered uh, among the nations because by that time, both the 10 tribes and uh, the kingdom of Judah had been spread all over the world already. Yes, there was a, a small nation of Israel and that's where Jesus was born and, and Jesus lived. But by then already, a lot of the Jews and therefore the early Christians were spread throughout the world. One of the things we'll notice about the book of James is that it's about practical Christianity. Let's continue reading. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. What a wonderful way to start a letter. The way I, I kind of see this, people don't write letters anymore, but I just got a letter that says, Peter, thought I'd drop you a line. Hope you and the family are doing good. Hey, enjoy this testing, this time of trial. Please ease into it. No, James, it was on his heart. He knew that the people spread around the world were going through tough times, times of being tested, times of the unknown, because the church was still very new, and times of trial, whether literal trial or being tried. Now, it doesn't say that you have to enjoy the testing, and depending on what the testing are, we all get tested. We all face some of those trials. It doesn't say you have to enjoy it, but if you know that good will come from it, that testing is of God, then it's like a bitter-coated chocolate candy. When you first bite into it, you say, oh, no, I'm not going to enjoy this. But when you get finally to the chocolate, it's like, this reward was worth it. Um, I survived the testing. I grew through the testing. Again, it applies only to Christians because at that point, and, and even now, if non-Christians are being tested, how would they know? How would they know how they measure up? What do, would they compare it to? So it is to Christians, and in this case, the early Christians. Allow me to ask a question, and one of my uh, research books uh, asked this question, and I loved it. Are there four Gospels or five? 
Well, the simple answer is four. I don't want to be a heretic. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We all know that. But the fifth one is us, is we are. Because a lot of people don't read the Bible. A lot of Christians don't read the Bible. So what they see is Matthew, Mark, or what they know is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and us. We are a walking, talking gospel. We represent Christ. And we'll get back to that. Let's continue reading. This time starting at verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. The man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. We're told to ask for wisdom, and we are to keep asking. Now, when I say that, be careful that we don't turn into the Pharisees. Lord, I pray, and I'm be- I know I'm better than them, and I'm better than this person over here. That is not good. Also, don't be like the pagans and say, Lord, I've sinned, please forgive me. Lord, please forgive me. I've sinned, please forgive me. Please keep forgiving me for this sin. Lord, this sin was horrible, please forgive me. The Lord understands the first time. But we are told to keep asking. Keep asking God for wisdom, for divine wisdom, not human wisdom. Because even on a good day, human wisdom isn't all that great. But through God's word and through the Holy Spirit, he will open up his word to us. How do we pray? Well, first of all, what do we ask for? And I've used this example before. You know, when a child prays, dear God, please be with mommy and daddy. I hope I don't have to eat Brussels sprouts ever again and get me Legos for Christmas, if you will. I do believe that God smiles at that and says, that is a good prayer. But as we, as adults, as Christians pray like that, I don't think it will please God. What do we ask for? We ask for wisdom. But ask without doubt. When you pray, know that God will give it to you. Keep in mind that if you're struggling to pay your bills and you say, God, I need $2,800 by the end of the month, it is unlikely that God will put a bag of gold coins in your front door and one day you'll open it and it's there. He could, because God is a God of miracles, but he likely won't. If you have a challenge with relationships, you can pray, God, please snap your finger and fix this. But it's not likely that that is what's going to happen. I must admit, I have had some challenges with, I'll say doubt, where I laid it before God on a Friday, and then throughout the weekend, I was, well, maybe I can do this, maybe I need to do that. But then I'm not really trusting God. Because I'm saying, well, if God doesn't work out, if that answer I don't like or I don't get, here's what I'm going to do. When we need to pray, when we pray, we need to trust God will deliver. And again, the more selfish the ask, the less likely God will supply it. See, God often changes the person who prays. God doesn't always or doesn't often remove the stumbling blocks But God changes the person that prays so that in your heart you understand, you can accept it, you can deal with it, you can live with it, you can live through it. Maybe you're being tested. Maybe this is happening for a reason. And I'm a firm believer that almost everything happens for a reason. We may not know it, we may not like it, but it does. Verse 6 says, ask and believe. If we ask for wisdom, and we believe we will get it, God will provide that. He will provide that to our minds, our hearts, and we can move on. Matthew 7, verse 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. It will happen. If you pray with genuine faith that God give you wisdom. For example, patience. I've prayed for patience lots, even impatiently. 
God doesn't snap his finger and say, Peter, here's patience. Unfortunately, that is a lesson all by itself. But ask and you will receive. We continue our reading at verse 9. The brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position, but the one who is rich should take pride in his low position because he will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. It blossom, falls, and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. This is where we need to talk about humility and pride. And I've heard it said that Mennonites often are, take great pride in their humility. And I say that tongue in cheek. Proverbs 16 verse 18, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. And we shorten that to pride goes before the fall. And it's often true. Not always, but it's often true. When we puff ourselves up and feel pretty good about our accomplishment or about our wisdom or about the advice we just gave someone, that may come back to haunt us. That may not be what God wants. Even if the advice is good advice, is solid advice, true advice, it may not be the way we delivered it, may not be to God's honor and glory. It also raises the question, who is rich and who is poor? Well, it's very simple. We can even in our society put a number to it. You know, we have a poverty line that's X number of dollars and, you know, you're well off or middle class if you have this range. However, when we look at the Bible, often that gets turned upside down. We read the parable of the rich man, rich young man, and I think everyone's familiar with it. He goes to Jesus and said, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus says, well, love God above all else and your neighbor as yourself. The young man says, this I've done since I was a young man, since I was a child. And Jesus says, that's wonderful. Go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor and come follow me. And the young man left saddened because he was very rich. And he had a hard time giving it up. And since there was no follow-up in the Bible, I don't anticipate he went and sold everything and followed Jesus. Nor, by the way, do I think that that's an instruction to all of us to go and sell everything we own and follow Jesus. To follow Jesus, yes, but our money and our wealth can work for God's kingdom. The thing is, what is your focus? What do you focus on? The the, uh, Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 12 says, sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether they eat little or much, but as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. And unfortunately, I've, I've seen that, I understand that. When you have a lot of money in the bank, good for you, you're blessed. However, you start worrying. The Bank of Canada rate went down. What does that mean for my investments? The Toronto Stock Exchange hasn't done very well this week. How much did I lose? Boy, I I hate hate to see that. And then you start worrying. Do I still have enough money when I retire? How is this going to look in in a year? What is the trend? And unfortunately, that time that you spend thinking about your investments about you know where the, the world is headed, where your, the economy is headed, it does two things. Number one, it takes time away from reading God's word, spending time in prayer, because you're now preoccupied. The second thing, equally important, perhaps more important, is it takes away our trust in God. God will provide. God will provide what we need. God never promised that he'll give us one million or two million or three million when we retire. Let's read verse 12. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Paul in 1 Corinthians 9 says, run the race so as to get the prize. We just finished the uh, uh, Paris Olympic, uh, the Olympic Games, with all the controversy that went with that. However, everyone there strived to get a medal. In the Greek and Roman times, it was a crown. The winner got the crown. The others probably got honorable mention. However, we're told to run the race to get the crown. And there isn't just one crown. There's a crown for each and every one of us. And 
we need to separate the fact that once we profess with Proverbs 10 verse 9, profess with our hearts, uh, sorry, with our mouths that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. And we will be saved once and for all unless we sin against the Holy Spirit. But that's a time, a sermon for a different time. Once we're saved, we're always saved. But in order to get the crown, and that may be in this life, that means longer life. That means um, rewards and wealth in this life. Or whether it means eternal crown. We need to run the race of life, the rat race as we've made it. We need to run it to get the crown. Verse 13, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Let's talk for a moment about testing, being tested and being tempted. We know that God tests us. God tests our faith in him, our trust in him. And we sing about it and we find it in the Bible. The refiner's fire burns away our sins and our impurities. And we will be like solid gold once we're tested. It goes back to the bitter coated chocolate. It's not always fun. You know, sometimes we can enjoy it, but we can enjoy the process and know that it makes us stronger, makes us purer. God does not tempt anyone. We actually tempt ourselves with our lusts and our desires and, and things like that. The devil's there. He says, oh, I'll help you with that. If you want to have lustful thoughts, let me provide some pictures for you. If you want to think about money, forget what Peter said. Let me, you know, boy, I think interest rates are going to drop further. You better worry some more about this. We are accountable for our own actions. And it's so easy to say, you know, once we become a Christian, we close the door to sin. But unfortunately, I don't think we're on our own able to close that door because then we'd stop sinning. And I don't know, I won't ask for a show of hands, but I don't think anyone here has been able to stop sinning completely. However, once we have improper thoughts, um, they are sinful. We, we learn when we read the uh, uh, story around the uh, Ten Commandments, for example, that if uh, in your heart you lust after someone, you've committed adultery. If you have a thought that says, I could, I'm so mad at that guy, I could kill him, you've just committed murder. So I think everyone has sinful thoughts, and sinful thoughts may become actions. If you think it enough, then it becomes part of you and it becomes a, a driving force. So we got to try and close that door as much as we can. See, King David, a man after God's own heart, struggled with that as well. We read it in 1 Chronicles uh, 21. Um, he wanted to do a census. He wanted to know, he was king of Israel, things were peaceful. He wanted to know how many people lived in his kingdom. More importantly, how big an army could he raise? God was not happy with that because you know why? With God and 50 soldiers, they could have conquered any army. But David briefly forgot about that. He wanted to know how big his army could be, how, you know, what countries he could conquer if he had to. David was forgiven, and we are forgiven as well. Keep in mind that we should repent of our sins and explain to God that we've done wrong, because that is something that King David was very good at. Again, it talks about premature physical death in this life, you know, when we sin, when we make God, God unhappy. And that's not always visible, because Ecclesiastes also says, what an injustice it is that the uh, wicked live a long and prosperous life and the godly live a short and miserable life. And so once we have received salvation, this is not talking about losing your salvation. Salvation in Christ is there. Okay, continuing on with verse 17. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, 
who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. One of the best gifts, the best gift, is a good and perfect gift, salvation. There are other very good gifts and, and near perfect gifts, but the perfect gift is salvation. And salvation is not based on the quality of our faith. Just like when a son or a daughter is born to you, it's a son or a daughter. And it, it's not dependent on how well this son or daughter does in life, how rich they become, how many friends they have, and so on. They are our sons and our daughters. Like God loves us unconditionally, we love our children unconditionally. We hope that they keep walking in the Lord, grow up in the Lord, keep walking in the Lord. But if they don't, we don't love them any less. And the same thing, once we profess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in our heart, God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. No ifs, ands, or buts. However, then our spiritual life starts, or should start. God is the one who initiates salvation. It is a gift, it's grace. Nothing we can do or say can make, us, uh, can make God love us more or less for that matter. He loves us unconditionally. First fruits. Um, I think since I made my slide, my, my, my mind changed a little bit on this. But first fruits. The Israelites brought the first fruits to the temple to give us an offer. And I think the lesson there is, as it is for us, don't wait till the end of the month to give to God and say, well, I'll see what I got left over and I'll give some of that to, uh, to God. We need to trust, just as we uh, talked about a moment ago, you know, when you pray, trust God. When you give first fruits, trust God. Continuing on, verse 19. My dear brothers, take note of this. Every, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. God gave us two ears and one mouth. We probably should use it in that proportion. And yes, that is something I struggle with. The Bible says we should be quick to listen and slow to anger. Ephesians 4, verse 26. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. See, there is such a thing as righteous anger, but really in the bigger scheme of things, that's a very small portion of our anger. Sometimes you disagree with someone. I'm right, you're wrong, and you know it. And now I'm mad, and I'm angry, and now I'm mad that I'm angry. The problem is this. When we're angry... We spend time thinking about retribution or how we can fix it or all these things. But again, it's time away from God. It's time away from spending uh, your time reading God's word, understanding what it means to your life, how you can put it into action, an action we're going to get to in just a moment. Get rid of moral filth and evil. Oh, man, that is tough, especially in this day and age. I'm starting to feel old, although I got gray hair. Thank you, Sherry. I, I'm very happy with my gray hair. Um, when I was young, I had to go out and get in trouble. However, now, through the internet, trouble comes right into my home, whether it's videos, whether it's pictures, whether it's blogs that are no good. But you type in any search word, and it pops up, and sometimes we're tempted, and we go and look at some of that. Get rid of all the moral filth and evil. That includes the people you hang out with. That includes the places you go to. Humbly accept the word. We have the word in front of us, right here. We know what it says, because most of you here have been Christians a long time, have been coming to church a very long time. Accept the word in your heart. Continue reading at 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently 
into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. Let's talk for a minute about action versus work versus listening. If you only come to church on Sunday morning to listen, saying, Peter, that was a great message, you know, I wonder what's for lunch. Well, today we know it's potluck, but I wonder what's for lunch. Yes, you've got to be here. You've got to hear the word, because if you don't hear the word, then you're even further behind. But if you don't put it into action, then what good is it? It allows me to talk or whoever's up here to talk for a while, but you've got to take action. That's why, very generally speaking, I finish the sermons with what does it mean to us? What do we take away? What action should we be spurred to? Works are mentioned in the Bible, but keep in mind they're not saving works. Nothing you do or say can get you into heaven. It's a free gift from Jesus, through Jesus' uh, sacrifice, a free gift from God. So, I've said it before about the Ten Commandments. You know, when I grew up, we would always look for loopholes, see if we could find something. Or we'd look and say, well, you know, maybe either that or it was just so miserable. You couldn't do this, couldn't do that, couldn't do that, and don't even think about this. Now that I'm Christian, I think, these are my friends. I don't want to steal from them. I don't want to hurt their feelings. I don't want to tell lies about them. So out of love, I do that. And so it's the same here. Because we are Christians, we want to put our faith into action. The face in the mirror is me. I'm talking to you here, but it, it's me. I looked. The perfect law that gives freedom. So let's talk about freedom. Is freedom the opportunity to do anything you want? Well, no, because that includes a lot of very bad and evil things that can get yourself or a lot of people in trouble. It is the freedom to not be bound by the chains of sin. It's the freedom to, to worship God, to, to choose for yourself what you want to do with your life. And there is a lot of freedom in that. But with freedom comes responsibility. Not forgetting what you've heard, but doing it. One of the uh, resources I read was, uh, he introduced the... Uh, uh, phrase, practicing action. And I like that better in some ways than doing works or doing good deeds. Practicing action with your faith, with what you've heard, with what you've learned. Practice action. James 2 verse 26, which we'll get to uh, next week, faith without deeds is dead. If, if you just sit there at home and say, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, still a Christian, I'm a Christian. Yes, you are a Christian, but you're not making any progress in your own life, in your own faith, or for the kingdom of God. 26, we're in the home stretch now. If anyone considers himself religious and, does not, and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Back to verse 19. If you are slow to speak, and even slower to anger, if you listen more than you speak, there's a good chance that you won't get yourself into too much trouble. I want to spend a few minutes talking about religion versus Christianity. And one of the resources I read said, Christianity actually isn't a religion. And let me explain that before you know, everybody gets up here. Religion, generally speaking, shows how you can get to God, whatever God they worship. Whether you've got to go on a pilgrimage, whether you've got to pay, whether you've got to do certain deeds you know, a number of times or say a certain prayer a number of times. And we know that that's not the case. Christianity is free for all. You have to come to the realization that we're a miserable sinner. And without Jesus Christ, our life is meaningless. I love the book of Ecclesiastes. Without Christ in our life, our life is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. So once you become a Christian, yes, there are some things we want to do. We want to um, put our faith into action. It's not that we must do. It's not that, you know, if you 
Go to church 50 out of 52 times, you get a check mark and you get another free pass you know, to heaven or to this or that. It doesn't work that way. We are saved. But as the, the verse there, 27, says, if we don't put our faith into practice, into action, then our faith is worthless towards God and God's kingdom. We're still saved. I want to talk about the assurance of salvation another time. We're still saved. That brings me to the conclusion. The book of James really spoke to me, and I hope it speaks to you as well. It, there are so many things, especially when we get into the works part uh, next week, for example. It was written by James, who was a, quite a new leader in the church of Jerusalem, and he later on is mentioned in the Bible quite a number of times. It is given to instruct and encourage us, because even today, we will become discouraged. You look at the world around you and say, how could we have made it so bad? Because yes, we're all part of this. How can God let this happen? Don't worry about God's part. Let's worry about our own part. James's letter is about practical Christianity. How to put our faith and practice action. There is no central doctrine, which is very interesting. It was written, uh, it was the first book or one of the first books that was actually written. Um, and so there's no central doctrine. It's just about faith in Jesus Christ. And I love the simplicity of that. How about you? Do you put your faith into action? Do you practice action? Are there some things today that you can walk away with and say, I got, a, I got an opportunity to put my faith into action. Do you experience freedom? Because so often we keep praying for the same sin over and over, but we need to, like a backpack that we carry around, uh, like uh, uh, Pilgrim's Progress, but we need to put that backpack at the cross of Jesus, at the foot of the cross, and say, I've been forgiven. Don't let the sins of the past weigh you down as you go through your life, because that also is counterproductive. And do you share your faith? Are you that fifth gospel? Do people in your community, at work, in your seniors group, do they know that you're a Christian? Did you tell them? Or can they tell by your walk and your talk how you act and react? For next week, I would ask you all to read chapter 2 and see what message God speaks to you before I have an opportunity to expose the meaning of the word. Let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for opening up the book of James to us. Thank you, Lord, that through your Holy Spirit, you've, you've given me a message to pass on and that we may take it into the world, Lord, and not be afraid to share because you have given us freedom, you have given us life, you've given us eternal life. Lord, we want that for anyone and everyone. Help us be that gospel message that may be the only message that certain people see or hear. Lord, that we don't walk around with Bibles and hitting people on the head and trying to convict, convict them through our message, but that our message may be our action. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for us, that you've died once and for all, 2,000 years ago, for all the sins that were, that are, and that are yet to come, Lord. Thank you, Lord God, for providing your son as a sacrifice for that. Lord, Holy Spirit, please help us um, reflect on this as we go into our week. In Jesus' name is our prayer and our gratitude. Amen. Thank you, Peter, for that challenging message. And uh, before we sing our closing song, I just have a couple of items. Um, I'd just like to say thank you for everybody that attended today's service. And uh, I'd also like to thank all the dear souls that are watching us in the lodge later. 
we just wish and hope that you all have a great grandparents day and uh, we'd like to pass that on so at this time i'd like to uh, say a grace for the upcoming potluck and so i just ask you to bow your heads <clears throat> dear lord thank you for the blessing of a potluck meal we ask for your blessing on the food and the conversation around the tables. As we formally start this year of learning, we ask you to bless all the hands that made the food. Help us all to have a thankful, grateful heart. Amen. And now I'd ask for the closing song. Please stand with us. <coughs> of Christ be with you. Stairs. Oh, sorry. That's right. Go out and be doers of the word. Cleanse your hearts of all pollution. Be quick to listen and learn. Welcome the word that God implants in you and bring it to birth in acts of righteousness and compassion. And may God pour grace upon you and bless you forever. May Christ Jesus reveal to you the truth of God's ways, and may the Holy Spirit fill your life with passion and love. May we go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen.